from downtown Milwaukee, welcome to Money Talk with Bob Landis. Each week, professional advisors from Landis and Company Investments discuss the latest financial developments, offering timely insight and long-term perspective. This is Money Talk for the weekend of 11-11-22. Checking the calendar, the not going to the playoff Green Bay Packers welcome former head coach Mike McCarthy and his Dallas Cowboys to Lambeau this Sunday. Your first place Milwaukee Bucks have a couple of home games this week. Atlanta is here on Monday and Cleveland on Wednesday. Train Fest is happening at State Fair this weekend. And who knew this week was Talk Money Week? You think I would have known that. <laughs> but now we're going to make up for that error. We're all here, so it's probably safe to say none of us won the Powerball jackpot. But a lottery winner in China won $30 million, and he wore a mascot costume to claim his cash. He did it in order to keep his wife and children from finding out about the money. <laughs> what kind of communist is he? Have you ever wondered about the definition of unintended circumstances? Well, try this on. The NFL team that calls itself Washington, D.C. home still has a naming problem. They're now called the Commanders, and that should be that, but leave it to the kids to mess with the establishment. Young fans have shortened the Commanders' nickname to the Commies, <laughs> and it's catching on in a big way. The Washington, D.C. Commies. I can't wait for the T-shirts. Okay, let's go overseas for this next one. An eight-year-old East Indian boy was bitten on the hand by a cobra. Well, that really angered the little boy, so he bit it back until it was dead. If that happened here, the kid would have his own reality show. And one bit of election news, Pennsylvania state lawmaker Tony DeLuca has been reelected despite passing away last month. I can only imagine how his opponent feels about losing to a dead guy. And our strange headline of the week, of course, we go to Florida. A Florida traveler stuffed a gun into a raw chicken and tried to bring it on the airplane. I know airline food is bad, but really? <laughs> on the podcast today, we have Steve Giles, Kendall Bauer, Joel Dressing, and wrapping up the week, here's Kyle Tedding. I'm not sure that's how you get a Thanksgiving turkey, but uh, here we are. Um, you know, important to note that uh, we're going to be recording a day early here, so no closing numbers to announce just yet, uh, but they will be posted in the show notes. Um, a, a happy Veterans Day, and thank you for your service to those uh, tomorrow the 11th uh, that, uh, that, that have served. Um, most importantly, I think worth pointing out, though, that today, Thursday, has been an incredible day for stocks. Uh, you look at uh, what was a pretty, I think, noteworthy announcement on consumer price inflation, which we'll touch on in a minute, um, but uh, some signs that uh, you know the, the Fed is having its intended consequence, and all of a sudden, it's off to the races. Wednesday had been a rough day uh, post-election, some concerns perhaps about um, you know, what maybe the inflation landscape might look like given s some, some mixed control. Uh, and all of a sudden, I think we were reminded pretty swiftly on Thursday, uh, the NASDAQ, one of the biggest winners on Thursday, posting one of its best days uh, in, in the last 15 years for sure. And as you look at uh, kind of the last time we were posting a, an almost 7.5% gain on the NASDAQ, it's going back to the financial crisis. So, Steve, maybe a good jumping off point, um, a reminder that these days are possible uh, that you can get one piece of news that I think changes everybody's expectations pretty swiftly, uh, and maybe it happens at, at a point in time in which you might least expect it. Yeah, absolutely, Kyle. And, and I really do think that this is a fantastic reminder for those clients who um, want to jump in and out of the market. Uh, there is no such thing as, as a good timing with respect to trying to time the market. Uh, a lot of the good days that we see will traditionally come on and, and historically have come on the coattails of the really bad days. Uh, we obviously hit bottom uh, so far this year, uh, uh, earlier in the quarter. But since the uh, inflation numbers have ebbed back down and are uh, reporting that the Fed's actions by raising rates are having an impact to indeed pull back consumer prices, uh, this market uh, was absolutely giddy today. 
Yeah, I think so clear that uh, inflation is the the force beyond every other force that seems to be driving prices right now. And Kendall, it wasn't just stock prices. Uh, we saw a pretty significant move lower in the the ten year U.S. Treasury yield, uh, potentially a sign that uh, you know I think the the market is expecting that rates will start to to calm down. Of course, we know that bond prices move inverse to yield, and so. Uh, just like in the stock market, perhaps a reminder to bond investors that maybe there's a reason to hold out hold out hope. Yeah, and again, so much of what we talk about ad nauseum, right, is the the whole basis of having a plan in the first place. And just like stocks, you can have a day like this, and you can look at the ten year and see, you know, it drop a pretty reasonable dip back down on the on the other side of the spectrum. So. For me, it boils down to if you have a plan in place, stick to it through thick and thin, you can avoid some of these huge swings. And whether it's good on the stock side and maybe not the best for bonds, um, you can just reduce some of the volatility uh, that we've seen year to date. Yeah, I think working through some of how that bond math works is always a fun exercise, right? And understanding that if you've got a high quality portfolio, of intermediate term bonds, you're probably sitting around a duration of maybe five years. And the math is pretty simple. Uh, if you want to get a rough idea of how much your bond fund is going to bump bump around when rates are rising or falling, you simply modify the duration by the, the change in interest rates, and you get an idea of what you gain or lose. Again, with, with prices moving inversely to yield, if rates or yield is rising, you'd expect your, your bond prices to go down. And so you move down a, a percent, uh, or I'm sorry, you move up a percent in rates, you'd expect a duration of five years bond portfolio to be down 5%. And that's what we've seen for much of the year. Uh, but again, in the span of a day, we lost uh, three-tenths of a percent in yield on the benchmark 10-year treasury. Well, that same five-year bond is up a percent and a half uh, in just a day. And so I think it's a reminder that um, when we're dealing with the kind of volatility we've been dealing with recently, uh, it's across the board, uh, and there's there's good and bad to it. Um, but we're seeing the good in the bonds now, uh, especially today, not just not just in the stocks. And and Kyle, it is another uh, swift reminder for investors that at the end of the day, there's really only two things that move stock prices: that's interest rates and earnings. I mean, it it all boils down to the fundamentals. And as much as everybody wants to worry about inflation or as much as everybody wants to talk about the results of the election, as much as people have no idea what the heck Putin is going to do in Ukraine next week, uh, the, the market is moving based upon those fundamentals. It all comes down to interest rates and earnings, and we saw that today. Well, and I think it's, it's so interesting to see two days so significantly different. The big negative day on Wednesday on the heels of the election where we all thought – all right, well, the market's a little disappointed in the, the results here. Investors at large maybe not terribly excited about what the next two years look like. Of course, I think a reminder that markets aren't all that interested long-term in who's in power politically. They're not all that interested long-term in um, kind of the political game. Uh, and that reminder came far quicker than it normally does on Thursday when we got some actual economic news that impacts interest rates. Uh, and it's, if it's interest rates and earnings, well, it's no wonder that that interest rate piece being impacted on Thursday was enough uh, to kind of send stocks back the other direction. You know, we've kind of we've kind of jumped around the news here a little bit, but Joel CPI released Thursday morning. Uh, the the thing that's allowed this to be such a good Thursday, such a good um, you know week so far. Um, you know, the, the data pointing to the fact that inflation continues to slow. It's still running at an elevated level seeing improvements. Kyle, there are all sorts of numbers in that CPI report or out of that CPI report that show that inflation is easing. And that's, you know, what we've been hoping for. That's what the, what the Fed has been, you know, fighting for all these months, all these, the six times that they raised interest rates so far this year. Um, and, and yet, um, inflation is still pretty high. You know, we, we had, uh, we, we, you can slice and dice these numbers all sorts of ways. But a common one is looking at the consumer price index year to year. So uh, since October of 2021, uh, inflation by that measure has gone up 7.7%. Um, that's um, been 
decreasing the last four months in a row. Um, it was up to 9.1% in June, if you remember, which was the highest since uh, 40 years ago. Um, so it's it's going down. 7.7 is a lot lower than 9.1. Um, but it's also, you know, almost four times more than what the Fed's long-term target rate is, and that's a 2% inflation rate. You know, I'm so fond of uh, the data we get from this CPI report because you can slice and dice it a million ways. You can really get as granular as you want. You can build a basket of things that are important to you because the reality is if you're not out shopping for a house, the uh, owner's equivalent rent probably isn't all that important to you. Uh, if you're not out buying a used car, you probably don't care all that much about used car prices, but most people that I know of need to eat. Most people that I know of need to fill their gas tank every once in a while. And so those are uh, areas where maybe the costs are a little more relevant. But as you look at, uh, you know, any number of ways that this is sliced and diced, the Atlanta Fed looks at something called sticky consumer price index. Uh, and, and it really is some of those things that uh, we anticipate will remain elevated price-wise. It's not, well, used car prices are higher today, but they'll probably go back down tomorrow. It's, okay, these prices are going to stick around. And what I think is interesting about that number is this last month, we actually saw the, the sticky consumer price index in negative territory again. Um, and so some signs that maybe the longer term direction is starting to hold. And Kyle, think about it. How often are you worried about used car prices, right? Or rental car prices or or shelter prices. You know, the, the shelter prices uh, in the consumer price index accounted for more than half of the monthly increase from September to October. And those that's an interesting one because, um, I mean, you know, all of us around this table, except for maybe Kendall, who recently got a house, I mean, you know, we our housing costs don't change month to month much. You know, our mortgages are, are about the same or our rent is about the same. Maybe if we're renting, that changes once a year or something, you know. But um, but those those housing costs um, have such a big impact on the consumer price index. And we're actually starting to see there are reports of, of rents um, and rent equivalent, you know, uh, housing costs coming down, starting to come down. But we won't – economists that I've been reading have, sa have said that you know, the way, the way this is measured, we're not going to see those uh, cost decreases impact the consumer price index until maybe the spring. And we've talked about why is it that inflation can't just come down overnight, right? When the Fed says, okay, we're going to raise interest rates, why doesn't inflation just suddenly start to come back down? Well, some of the biggest components of inflation are the very things we're just talking about, right? They're not things you buy all the time. And so it doesn't matter that it's a little more expensive to borrow to buy a house. doesn't matter that your car loan's a little more expensive. If it's going to be another three years before you need to buy a car, if you've been locked into that same mortgage for the last 10 years, it's going to be paid off five years from now. You don't care that interest rates are 7% now. You're not moving anytime soon. And so I think it's, it's clear why some of the impact of what the Fed has done takes a little while to be digested. And then you add in all of the turbulence that was caused by the COVID pandemic that we're still trying to figure out what equilibrium is in so many service areas and in so many goods that, yeah, it's no wonder that inflation doesn't just go back to 2% overnight. It's going to take time. Right. And um, yeah, so another example is food. I mean, food is something that, you know, we do all spend money on every day. Um, so the the month to month increase, the inflation rate, um, in, in for food was the lowest in October than it was since last December. Still, it's really high. You know, still it's it's really up there. But it's the direction that we're looking at here, and the direction is encouraging. Yeah, and I think that's the key, and that's what the market cares about is not that we get back to the number that the Fed is targeting today, but that we're on the path towards that number because you know the the easiest way to get there is to keep moving in that direction. So I think you know as far as inflation is concerned. Certainly, it's going to be a conversation for a while longer, um, but encouraging signs this week that we're headed in the right direction. As far as other economic news this week, we've got a, a confidence report tomorrow um, looking at consumers, but not a ton else on the uh, on the economic calendar. Uh, a couple of things. The, the, uh, the initial claims for unemployment insurance, those are down a couple of weeks in a row. Um, they're still historically low. 
which shows that we still have a strong labor market, which um, emboldens the Fed to, to be more aggressive on raising interest rates because it doesn't have to worry about the labor market as much. Um, and then we had numbers on Monday from the Fed um, looking at revolving um, credit um, or credit card debt. And um, that's actually, uh, it's still high, but it's, it's getting lower. Um, it, I mean, the, the increase is, is less. So it's suggesting that maybe that consumers are slowing down a little bit in their spending. But um, it's the, the, the thing that I like to point out is that, I mean, it's been above the pre-pandemic level um, since April. And in the Great Recession, in the financial collapse, it took more than a decade to recover the point at which people were confident enough in their uh, personal econo economics that they were borrowing money through credit cards to spend. Maybe change gears a little bit here, Kendall, as we look at kind of some year-end planning opportunities. It seems odd in a year in which stocks are down as much as they are to be having conversations about uh, capital gains distributions from our stock funds. And yet, um, you know, there's a number of, of stock-focused mutual funds that are set to pay some substantial capital gains. Maybe a little bit of silver lining there we can talk about, but, you know, maybe help us understand what's going on here. Yeah, it can be a kind of a, <clears throat> a shock in a year like this, right, to find out that, you know, maybe one of your stock funds in a taxable account is paying a, a rather large capital gain. But it is, you know, a reminder to investors that those funds have to pass through you know, the recognized gains on the individual stocks they hold within them. Many funds sitting on a lot of winners over the last three years. Um, so when you have a year like this and maybe there's more redemption requests to the fund, um, they have to make sales and they're choosing to do so from, you know, the winners in, inside the funds. Um, now, the, the upside or the, the other side of the coin is you know, there may be opportunities to do some subsequent tax loss harvesting in, in taxable accounts to maybe offset some of those gains. Um, so not all doom and gloom. Right? There's ways to navigate and it's a good opportunity to give your advisor a call and you know, if you have a pretty sizable amount of cash in a taxable account, find out if there's a, a strategy to help minimize some capital gains. And, and this year is rather unique, Kendall, in that we don't often have a chance to do tax loss trading on our bond funds. And so this is one of those years that uh, you're going to have bond funds that are down in taxable accounts that you can sell to offset these gains that are going to be realized in your stock funds. Uh, another way to avoid having to pay the capital gain tax on the stock fund is to just unload the stock fund in the first place. Obviously, you'd want to do your math and make sure that you work with your advisor or your tax accountant before you sell to make sure you're not triggering a higher capital gain because you've held that fund for much, much longer than maybe the, the gain that's being realized and passed through to you. Yeah, so a reminder that uh, these positions held in qualified accounts, things like IRAs, really not any, any change to your value here. They're going to pay out a distribution. If you turn around and reinvest that, you get more shares, and so ultimately... Um, you know, there's no real change to the math. But the reverse of that is if you're reinvesting that distribution in a taxable account, a reminder also that you've now paid tax on that distribution, but your cost basis moves a little bit higher. And so uh, you've escalated, you've moved forward some of your tax liability, but down the road, you'll get a little bit of benefit because your cost basis is higher. And so it's not for nothing. Um, there's certainly plenty of ways to try to mitigate the liability this year. Um, it's a conversation we've had on the podcast and had with individual clients really since spring uh, when some of these things started to develop. Um, but it's something that we, we're pushing through here year in to kind of make sure that any of these liabilities that do pop up, we've got a pretty good idea of, of how we navigate them. So, uh, you know, with that, I think uh, it, it's a pleasure, as always, to do the show for you. We enjoy doing it, and we will talk to you again next week. Thank you for listening to Money Talk with Bob Landis. If you have a financial question you want answered on next week's show, email it to moneytalk at landis.com. To keep informed throughout the week, visit our Money Talk page at landis.com. <laughs>